All righty. So thank you for that. As he said, um, I'm Joan, and I'm Joan, and he's Rich. Go ahead. You can figure that out all by yourselves. <laughs> so here's our premise, and that was a really wonderful setup we just got from uh, from the keynote speaker. There is that you know hackers teach themselves things all the time, but how do you translate that into a traditional school environment? So how do you how do you take self-learning and make it effective? So here's a little prologue. So I'm a recovering rocket scientist, and he's a hacker. The two of us were together at a 3D printer company called Deesmaker, um, and uh, we spun out a company called Nonscriptum from that to teach people things, particularly uh, electronics and particularly, particularly 3D printing. And so I was taught very traditionally. I have a degree from MIT. Um, Rich is a self-taught hacker. And we started working together and learning some things together and realized that a lot of the ways we were talking to each other, we could use to talk to a lot more people. Go ahead. So our first thing we did together is a, um, among other things, was a, um, a book of 3D printable science projects because we said, well, you know, you can show a lot of science concepts. You can think about a lot of them geometrically without piling on the algebra. So we wrote a couple of books for A-Press. Our first editor is sitting in the corner there, so it's all her fault, ultimately. <laughs> so go ahead. So for instance, there's a scientific law called Kepler's Law from uh, Johannes Kepler in the 1600s that ties together how fast you're going around a, um, how fast two bodies are circling around each other, basically. So the thing that looks like a shoehorn is the orbit of Halley's Comet, and the height is how fast you're going in the orbit at that point. So as you go closer and closer to the sun, you go faster and faster and faster. As you go farther out, you, um, you go slower and slower and slower. And the three over here are the orbits of Earth, the orbit of Venus, and the orbit of Mercury. And I worked at JPL for 16 years, and I never realized that Mercury had an elliptical, slightly elliptical orbit. So it goes a little faster at one end than the other. So you can learn interesting things. I thought it was wrong. I was like, oh, man, the code's wrong. And you learn interesting things and get a lot of intuition out of it that you wouldn't otherwise. We also um, have made some botanical models. And so these are all written in OpenSCAD, by the way. So the, the interesting thing is that plants have a few very simple rules that they follow. They have a lot more complex rules, too. But evolution has pulled out some real simple ones. And that plants tend to lay out their biomass in a way that doesn't do that minimally overlaps. Because if you think about it, a plant who has leaves wants to get as much sun on it as they can. A plant that's trying to attract bugs wants as much surface area as possible to attract a bug. So these two models are the same open SCAD code with just a couple numbers different. And it's really interesting when you go into the literature and you start reading, you know, how do these rules work? You read a tremendous amount of stuff. But then you start talking to plant biologists, and they say, oh, yeah, they maximize their surface area. And it's not taught that way. And so we, we discover interesting things like that. Go ahead. Um, OK, so show of hands, we have three objects here that are hollow, that hold water. I'm going to ask you which one you think holds the most water, OK? So raise your hand if you think it's this one. Raise your hand if you think it's this one. Nobody's had coffee yet. Raise your hand if you think it's this one. It's all the same people. <laughs> so you've learned some geometry today. So um, objects that have the same base area and the same height have the, um, if they're uh, enclosed like this, anything, a number of sides have the same area. Otherwise, a cylinder with the base area of a cone, the cone three times as high has the same surface, has same volume. So there's some things like that that are hard to visualize. And we do a lot of events. We put these out. Little kids who have just learned it tell their parents, Mom, they're all the same, which is kind of cool. So our, um, our books developed a following, particularly in the blind community, interestingly enough. But it was kind of piecemeal. You know, people would take these lessons. They'd add them to things. We said, well, you know, how can we do more than that? How can we really take something and really revise how you teach a math subject or how you teach a science subject. How can we really make a difference? So in the course of doing some of these models, 
we had to do a little bit of calculus stuff, and we said, you know, if we go back to look at Isaac Newton's original work, Principia, um, and if any of you are local and stick, aren't local and are sticking around a little bit, Isaac Newton's copy of Principia is at the Huntington Library with his notes on it, which is awesome. So Newton published this with almost no algebra. If you go back and look in Principia, it's all geometry, pictures, diagrams. There's no algebra in that thing. And if you look at it, you say, well, you know, these concepts are interesting. They're physics-based and focused. At the time, there's a guy named Leibniz who published a paper very similar to calculus. They're usually co-credited, unless you happen to be in Cambridge, England, um, or uh, presumably in, in, uh, in Germany. But um, about the same time, Leibniz published several papers that derive kind of the same thing. And Leibniz's is um, notation won out. And so people started teaching, you know, teaching calculus, mostly algebra focus. And so how did that turn out? So calculus right now, if any of you are not from the US, I apologize. This is sort of a US-centric metric here. But 25% of, of students who teach, who uh, take calculus at a tier one university, which is your MIT, your Harvard's and Stanford's and places like that, get a D or an F or withdraw. So something's very wrong there. Um, there's something called the AP exam. 308,000 people-ish took calculus AB, which is the lower level one. And a score of one is, a, is basically an F, and a score of five is basically an A. And so you see um, the percentage that scored one on AB exam is about half, and a tiny number get a higher one. BC is a higher level one, and so people self-select, and more of them get A's. And the critical thing is that, and this, we can give you data for that if you want it, and people, and particularly women who fail calculus, tend to leave the STEM track forever. So they, they leave it, they say, science isn't for me, to Brian's point, or to Mike's point. Go ahead. And so the question we had asked ourselves is, what if Isaac Newton had had a 3D printer and other mathematicians behind them? What if they had been able to talk geometrically about their concepts and what if we could go back now and teach calculus that way? How might math have evolved and how can we evolve it? And Rich will take over from here. So we started a, uh, a Hackaday Prize uh, uh, project a few years ago uh, based around this concept of teaching, uh, teaching calculus concepts uh, using these 3D models, uh, teaching them using geometry and, and spatial reasoning rather than uh, rather than all this algebra. Uh, I, I had always had trouble with the algebra. Uh, not that the algebra was difficult, it just, it just didn't uh, give me the intuition I needed to, to actually solve a problem. Uh, so we tried uh, several different things. Uh, we tried some electronics projects. Uh, so this was a circuit playground. Uh, we were using the accelerometer to talk about uh, speed versus acceleration and, and uh, things we can do with acceleration. And uh, so this uh, simply lights up the LEDs that are at the bottom. So you can turn it over and the LEDs stay at the bottom. Uh, but if you, if the acceleration it sees is zero in two out of three axes, uh, it turns green um, and they all light up. And uh, you can do an experiment with this. You can throw it up in the air uh, and it all turns green immediately until it stop, until you catch it or it hits the ground. Um, uh, you can, of course, do the same experiment with your phone, but you don't want to be throwing your phone up in the air. Uh, the next thing I tried to build was a uh, device for mechanically plotting the differential of a curve, uh, the, um, the, the derivative of a curve, sorry, um, mechanical differentiator. Um, which I had a, a concept for. Uh, I figured out all the pieces I needed to make it work, and then building it got complicated. And, uh, and somebody wouldn't let me spend the time I needed to finish it. That terrible partner he is. Um, so what we realized was we needed, uh, we needed to replace calculus entirely um, the way it's taught. Uh, we couldn't just throw things in. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, lot of projects that have you know, a couple of models here and there. Uh, 
with no, no real path through them. Uh, they're kind of meant to be dropped into a regular curriculum, uh, which is uh, very flawed in the way things are taught. Um, uh, the, the, way, the way calculus is taught is basically meant to build up the calculus skill, or the algebra skills that you need uh, one by one, rather than actually teaching things uh, in the order that makes sense. There, there are concepts that are very similar to one another uh, that should be taught together, but one requires more complicated calculus, and so it's taught three semesters later, um, making the whole thing more difficult. Um, and so uh, plan B was to use only 3D printed objects because we didn't want to have to, uh, didn't want people to have to learn too many different things uh, outside of calculus on the way to learning calculus. So we created models for uh, explaining the concept of limits uh, uh, as uh, this actually looks a lot like one of the illustrations uh, that we found in Principia, uh, where you break up a, a curve or a surface uh, into boxes. And as the boxes get smaller and smaller, they uh, more closely approximate the curve. So there's, we have a uh, little piece that we can lay on top of these and, and, and show that it fits better uh, as the boxes get smaller. Uh, we created models uh, to explain the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is that uh, if you have a curve and you, here's that model, uh, if you have a curve, <coughs> excuse me, if you have a curve and you uh, uh, want to know its derivative, uh, you can calculate that, and then if you want to know the, uh, the integral, of that uh, resulting curve, it's the derivative. Uh, that is an example with sines and cosines, which are which have that relationship to each other. Um, and we've also done those with uh, we don't have them with uh, straight lines and parabolas as well. Um, and I plotted these on separate axes because. Um, it bothered me that uh, there are a lot of graphs that show these uh, and show them on the same axes, but the, if you actually do the dimensional analysis of these problems, they're not the same units. And so they should really be on separate axes. Uh, we talked about uh, sets of differential equations. So this, uh, this model represents the uh, Lotka-Volterra uh, equations, which is uh, otherwise known as predator-prey. So this is a three-dimensional graph. Uh, so this axis is time. This is the number of prey species, say rabbits, and this is the number of predator, members of the predator species, say foxes. Uh, so the way this works is uh, you start out with a small number of rabbits. They do what rabbits do, and you get more rabbits. Uh, and then the fox population uh, begins to increase because they have a huge food source. Uh, but then they overeat, and uh, that uh, causes the rabbit population to fall, which in turn causes the fox population to fall. So if you go on Wikipedia, you'll see this graph, you'll see this graph, and you'll kind of see this shape that it makes, but it's not clear how they relate to one another. So this is, this is a very tangible way to do that. And here are those three views again. Uh, so we had to think about how to display this. This model actually went through a lot of iterations. Uh, some of the early ones looked like, uh, like this. We tried to, to model it using uh, walls to uh, support a line going through space. Uh, but it, uh, it was easy to lose, uh, lose sight of where zero was, which is how we uh, ended up on this one. So one side effect of this is that um, we got on the radar of the uh, teachers of the visually impaired um, who were early adopters and using 3D printers for education for extremely obvious reasons, right? Um, and so um, we have a 2016 Hackaday Prize entry um, for 3D printing for the visually impaired where we looked at that um, and we were, whatever the term was, semifinals or something in 2016 for that. But um, there's some challenges in, in how in printing 3D printed Braille and things like that. Turns out that most of them don't want actual, don't we actually want um, those labels anyway? So we've been doing some experiments. This is uh, Lindsay Yazzolino, who's a blind biologist, 
And we've um, been doing this talk at a variety of places or variations on it. And um, we brought along the models that we were talking about in the talk and gave them to her one at a time so that she could follow along on all the slides. And you know, people, after a minute or two, whispered, hey, pass those around, because we want to see them too. And so we found that the engagement in the audience just generally was an awful lot higher because people could handle the models and kind of follow along. So, so it's, it's a side effect that you take extreme tactile learners and you can do some interesting things with them. Go ahead. So here's our big question um, that we're working on right now is how does the natural order of concepts change if you're teaching purely geometrically and trying to avoid algebra as much as you can? Um, you start with, you start with three-dimensional things because that makes more sense. You don't start with 2D and work up to 3D. You start with 3D and come down. And it's kind of an interesting thing that happens. And one of the best, what we call anchor concepts, to walk people through these fundamental things that are, that are naturally taught in all kinds of dear, weird and wonderful ways um, if you start over. And how much do we connect to, quote unquote, traditional ways of teaching calculus? Go ahead. So where we stand right now, is that MIT Press has accepted a textbook for this, um, which we're excited about. So we're working, and we're in the thick of that now. We're delivering a big chunk of it December 3rd. And so uh, they took a chance on us. When we took it to a couple of other publishers, they said, oh, well, you know, if you redo this, so the order's the same as a usual calculus textbook, we'll think about it. We said, you're missing the point. <laughs> so, you know, so we had to start over. But MIT Press did accept that, and so that will be available in a while. And um, feel free to contact us. Um, our Hackaday Calculus project on hackaday.io we has um, some of the early models open source. The models will be open source, by the way. MIT has agreed to that. So all the models for the book will be open source. Um, and we have a few of the early models are on our Hackaday project, which if you just Google Hacker Calculus is called, or go on our website under projects, you can find us. And that's our contact info. And we really appreciate Hackaday giving us the stage and all this enthusiasm, and I guess we'll, we'll be in the back for questions afterwards. So thank you.